In the last sermon I gave, which was on Memorial Day, I expressed my desire to transform the holiday. Rather than a day to honor only those who died in war on behalf of the United States, we could honor all those who died in war and all those who have died from violence on our streets. And I suggested we could best honor them by working for peace so it doesn't continue to happen. For today, I set out to redefine religion, but as I wrote, I realized I wanted to change things in the sermon and incorporate other things. (laughs) If you don't believe in evolution, watch someone write a sermon. (laughs) For instance, on Friday, I realized I wasn't trying to redefine religion. I was trying to change the connotation, which is arguably more difficult. The connotation, of course, is the associated or secondary meaning of a word or expression. For instance, like, home means warmth and love. And I found it really interesting that the dictionary where I checked the definition of connotation gave this example. Religion has always had a negative connotation for me. I originally started out with a different sermon title, and I changed one of the readings at the last minute. As I worked on the sermon, the focus shifted. I was going to focus more on pride, and I still do talk about it, as you can tell from the readings and what I'm wearing. June is Pride Month, which began 55 years ago after the Stonewall Riots, a series of gay liberation protests in Greenwich Village. But Reverend Teague's sermon last week was so compelling, it didn't bother me that my focus shifted slightly to talk about religion and spirituality. Religion is notoriously difficult to describe. Earlier this month, in a Fox News interview, a leading presidential candidate unleashed an impossible-to-follow word salad in an attempt to do so. If you haven't seen it, you can just Google it, and if your search doesn't work with the name of one candidate, try another. (laughs) So, allow me to begin by telling you why I'm compelled to attempt to change what the current connotation seems to be. As some of you may have heard me say, I have a ginormous kennel of pet peeves. Like when someone says soundtrack rather than original cast recording. (laughs) Clearly, the former is from a movie and the latter is a recording of a Broadway show. When someone on social media misuses there, there, or there, or two, two, or two, again, their differences are clear. You can see I lead a tortured life. Perhaps the one that annoys me the most is, again on social media, when someone posts a meme denigrating religion as opposed to spirituality. There were several examples along the same lines, but the most recent one I saw was an underwater photo of divers in a shark cage while the sharks swam freely around them. The divers were labeled religion while the sharks were labeled spirituality. Then there are those who post questions like, what is the most useless profession? Multiple multiple people invariably reply pastor or megachurch minister. Of course, that stings. Even the iconic John Lennon got it wrong in the song Imagine. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion to. Well, John, it depends on how you view religion. Some of those who post these things to social media no doubt label themselves as spiritual but not religious, or SBNR. The second title of this sermon was LGBTQ plus SBNR. (laughs) I changed it. These SBNR were the topic of many a conversation when I was in seminary. How do we entice these folks back to church, if they ever came at all? They are also called nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S, because when asked their religion when filling out a form, they checked the box next to none. 
Over the years, there became less societal pressure to attend church. People not welcome in the churches they grew up in because of their sexual identity, and young people who saw what they viewed as hypocrisy sought a spirituality without the dogma, without the rules, without the going to a particular building once or twice a week. People began to look for a way to further their spiritual growth outside the confines of organized religion. Historically, the words religion and spiritual were used synonymously to describe various aspects of the concept of religion. More recently, people have begun to associate spirituality with the interior life of the individual, emphasizing the mind, body, and spirit, and religion with the organizational or communal dimensions. Like the meme, the divers were enclosed in a structure that restricted their exploration, and the sharks were free to explore. Now, of course, all churches are not alike, not even all UU churches. The railing against having to unquestioningly believe what you're told is clearly a reference to creedal churches, not covenantal ones like ours. If you've been to Membership 101, you have probably heard me say members of creedal churches agree to believe the same things. Members of covenantal churches, like ours, on how we will treat one another and the world. Now, most people don't even realize there are covenantal churches as opposed to creedal ones. You may remember this story. In May 2004, Texas controller Carol Keaton Strayhorn ruled that Unitarian Universalism was not a religion because it does not have one system of belief and stripped the Red River Unitarian Universalist Church in Denison, Texas of its tax-exempt status. Now, within weeks, she reversed her decision. I was excited when I became a UU chaplain in a hospital in a diverse city because UUs respect wisdom in many faith traditions. I looked forward to meeting patients of various religions, but they seemed to assume chaplain meant Christian, especially in Texas, and they didn't seem to want to talk to me. I suppose if you squint, I look like a Baptist minister. <laughs> Unfortunately, people all too often hear Christianity when you say religion, at least here in the United States. But the Christianity of today is typically not what was practiced in Jesus' day, or even what's in the Bible. Well, closer to what's described by Paul than demonstrated by Jesus, but that's another sermon. There are rules that are scriptural but ignored and rules that aren't scriptural, but many assume they are. And translations can be a big problem. The word homosexual appeared for the first time in 1946 in the Bible in an apparent mistranslation. I fear when people hear the word religion, they think of the Christian nationalism we so often see in the U.S. today. Christian nationalists are focused on the internal politics of society, such as legislating civil and criminal laws that reflect their narrow rules over love view of Christianity. Now, if you believe in the separation of church and state, that may be problematic for you. Now, in my humble opinion, Christianity worked best when it was countercultural. Jesus was executed by the empire for riling people up. Once Constantine wedded empire with Christianity, and it became the official religion of the empire, the focus inevitably shifted from love to rules. Since that Council of Nicaea, rules in having power over others have seemingly taken precedence over a message of love. Having taken Christian history class in seminary, I know the Catholic Church did little to reverse that. Now, those of you who keep up with the news will know that on Wednesday, Governor Jeff Landry signed off on a measure that orders every public school classroom in Louisiana to display a poster of the Ten Commandments. Commandments, rules, religion as the shark cage instead of religion as an ocean of spirituality and love. You may have seen this bit of writing by Kurt Vonnegut on social media. 
For some reason, the most vocal Christians among us never mention the Beatitudes, but often with tears in their eyes, they demand that the Ten Commandments be posted in public buildings. And of course, that's Moses, not Jesus. I haven't heard one of them demand that the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, be posted anywhere. Blessed are the merciful in a courtroom. Blessed are the peacemakers in the Pentagon. Give me a break. People seem to enjoy wielding power over others. From the schoolyard bully to the arms race, they want others to play by their rules while claiming it's out of love. I think the most egregious example of claiming people have to follow your rules is to claim you actually own them. We just celebrated Juneteenth, a Southeast Texas tradition that grew into a national holiday. Of course, one can find mention of slavery in the Bible, evidence that the Bible was often descriptive and not prescriptive. But I noticed it doesn't mention what race the slaves have to be. So I can't help but wonder why those who believe slavery is such a good thing don't volunteer to be one. Many people don't know an interesting fact about the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. This passage is from an article citing Reuters and Religion News Service, among others. In 1845, the Southern Baptists separated from the Triennial Convention in order to support slavery, which the Southern churches regarded as an institution of heaven. During the 19th and most of the 20th century, it played a central role in Southern racial attitudes, supporting racial segregation and the lost cause of the Confederacy, while opposing interracial marriage. In 1995, the organization apologized for racial positions in its history. They may have apologized over 100 years too late, but they still forbid women from becoming pastors and denounce same-sex marriage as an abomination. Just two weeks ago, they voted to oppose the use of in vitro fertilization. It's obvious where the rules are. It's obvious who they want to have power over. It's harder to see the love or spirituality. It seemed clear to me why young people might be suspicious of religion when that is what they see. People of color, people of color are often given the cold shoulder in some churches, and sexual minorities are prayed over as they're shown the door when it is discovered who they really are. In the book, Ministry Among God's Queer Folk, which was a book that was assigned to me in seminary, I read. However, the urgent question here is, what is the primary and ultimate source of the desire to rid oneself of being lesbian, gay, or bisexual? It would be hard to answer anything but religion. So in a very real way, religion is providing an answer, reparative therapy, to a problem that religion itself has created. Religion is trying to repair something that religion has damaged and continues to damage. Logic, charity, and justice demand that the damaging stop. I first started thinking about religion versus spirituality theme when it occurred to me how many of our lives of the spirits exemplars lifted up people and were more accepting of difference instead of giving others rules to follow. If you took part in Lives of the Spirit, you'll know the people we talked about ranged from an Indian Hindu monk to a Jewish rabbi to a Buddhist monk. And yes, there was a Baptist and a Catholic. I quoted Thich Nhat Hanh in The Call to Worship. The original title of this sermon was Lives of the Two Spirit. As the British say, too clever by half. In passage after passage, they would say something akin to this by the UU minister we studied this month, Reverend Forrest Church. Want what you have, do what you can, be who you are. Howard Thurman wrote, there is something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. It is the only true guide you will ever have. 
And if you cannot hear it, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. And here's another quote from that seminary textbook. In a passage discussing the dictum, love the sinner, hate the sin. On a practical level, it is extremely difficult to make the separation between sin and sinner. What one hates, one works against, even destroys. It's difficult to hate an abstraction, such as sin, but easy to hate a person perceived as sinful. Hate always comes to land on the sinner. Again, Swami Vivekananda, the Vedanta recognizes no sin, it only recognizes error. And the greatest error, says the Vedanta, is to say that you are weak, that you are a sinner, a miserable creature, and that you have no power and you cannot do this and that. It's clear to me that spirituality includes not only accepting but rejoicing in ourselves and focusing on our own growth, not obsessing about other people's behavior, and lifting up our community in love. Too many denominations have instead embraced pointing out the perceived sins of others, beating people down with rules, and demanding conformity. I had a seminary professor who accused preachers who did such things as committing theological malpractice. Some who will talk to me after the service may say I was a bit harsh on several denominations, especially when ours is so imperfect in many ways, and I get that. But I hope you heard my sermon in January. It was the first one I gave after my parents died. I described the tension I felt between a faith that worked for them, was meaningful for them, and the one I had left. There were people in their church who loved them, in fact, who, had lo who loved all of my family, but it was a denomination that had done much irreparable harm to LBGTQ people. I could embrace the community, but not the denomination. 10 or 12 years ago, I noticed some churches would change their big signs out front. The name of the church, often something catchy, was in large letters, and the na name of the denomination in small letters, if at all. The Experience United Methodist Church. I don't think it's a coincidence. I quit my job to go to seminary with people who had parents who were younger than I was. Because I believe religion can be a force for good in the world, especially Unitarian Universalism. And I hope when people think of religion, they will begin thinking of the community where people come to find support for their exploration of spirituality instead of an institution with demands and rules and unacceptance. So if I was harsh, it's because it angers me that what should be people in community loving and lifting others up has been eclipsed by those doing just the opposite and hurting people deeply in the process. So forgive me for being a bit salty to those who do just that. We need to let people know religion is not a four-letter word. It especially angers me when I hear time and time again of people who were so hurt by their church they won't darken the door of any church again, even one like ours. They can't imagine that any church would be different. Well, I believe this community has a lot to offer them. Love, support, perhaps even healing. These people have abandoned any hope of exploring a very, very important aspect of their life because of the harm done against them. And that makes me not only angry, but profoundly sad. I live for the day where the connotation of religion is not negative. I want people to know that religion is the community where people on a spiritual journey come together to accept, support, and love one another and join together to make the world a better place. Because that's what it was intended to be and still can be. May we come together in community and make it so. 
Amen.